episode of Primary News. We all know what is a coin, but what is a Bitcoin? In simple words, Bitcoin is a digital currency which was born in 18th August 2008. Though it's in the market for a decade now, its popularity and demand has always been in the state due to its fluctuating rate. In January 2011, one Bitcoin was equal to one dollar and by July 2014, one Bitcoin was equal to one thousand dollars. To everyone's surprise, in May 2018, its value rose to an all-time high of ten thousand dollars. Unfortunately, the value crashed and today one Bitcoin is equal to $5,153. Let's watch this simple video created by TRT World that explains Bitcoins. You may have heard of Bitcoin by now and the hype it had over the last few weeks. But what is Bitcoin really? Basically, it's a new form of currency known as cryptocurrency or crypto for short. It's not like everyday paper money that we're used to but a form of digital currency invented by a mysterious person known as Satoshi Nakamoto. The goal was to create a peer-to-peer -peer system for online payments. P2P means that it's decentralized and works independent of any financial institution. Think of it like this. When you go into a coffee shop to buy a latte with your bank card, you don't actually give any money to the cafe owner. The bank does. With digital currency, there's no banks, no entities or governments that control it, eliminating the need for a middleman. So where does Bitcoin come from? Well, it's mined. Not with a traditional pickaxe, but with computing complex mathematical equations. Once the equations are solved, new Bitcoins are generated, or mined. The term mining is commonly used because, like our mineral resources, there's a limited number of Bitcoins out there. In the case of Bitcoin, that number is 21 million, period. But there's more. Miners don't only generate new Bitcoins. They use their computers to verify transactions and prevent fraud 24 hours a day. This is done by collecting all transactions made during a set period into a list called the block. It's the miner's job to confirm those transactions and write them into a general ledger, which kind of resembles a huge, giant, universally accessible spreadsheet. So instead of one person controlling everything, there are thousands of computers around the world connected to a network which all come to an agreement on which transactions are valid. But how does it do all this? By using something called blockchain. If Bitcoin is email, then blockchain is the internet. Another thing to mention, mining Bitcoin is costly. There's the high cost of electricity and the hardware components wearing out. An individual mining Bitcoin would find it really difficult to make any money that way. That's why there are Bitcoin farms around the world. Mining, processing and verifying transactions. People can invest in them and get a small percentage of the returns. Alternatively, Bitcoin can be traded on many exchanges. An exchange is a marketplace where you may buy or sell your crypto in exchange for regular currencies. There are many exchanges that any person can use. Coinbase, Bittrex and Kraken are some of the most popular. Interesting video, isn't it? China is the world's largest market for computers hardware designed to mine bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies. However, China wants to ban bitcoin mining as bitcoin mining wastes a lot of electricity and China is concerned about resource wastage and environmental pollution caused as a result for this. You would have heard about satellites very often in connection with human activities in space. But what is a satellite? Let's explore. A satellite is an object in space that orbits or circles around a bigger object. There are two kinds of satellites, natural such as the moon orbiting the earth and artificial such as communication satellites or the International Space Station orbiting the earth. Handful of countries have their own satellites in the orbit. What is the purpose of these satellites or what are they doing in space? Satellites are designed and launched into space to do specific jobs. It could be to improve global communication, navigation capability, security, defense, safety, emergency management, the environment and health, etc. 
As technology advances, the potential of satellites will undoubtedly continue to grow. Now you would have thinking that how could a human-made satellite be placed into a specific orbit of Earth or any other orbit of any other planet? Most satellites are not into space on rockets. Since most of the countries don't have the satellite launching capability, they are depending on other countries who have their own launching vehicles. Now, let's see what happened in India on 1st of April 2019. In a single vehicle called PSLV C45, Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO helped four other countries to launch their 29 satellites in three different orbits. Isn't it amazing? 24 satellites from USA, two from Lithuania, one each from Spain and Switzerland in addition to India's own intelligence satellite called EMISAT. Now, some interesting news about UAE space program. Emirati astronauts sets for epic journey to the International Space Station on 25th September 2019. Are you curious to know the name of the astronaut? It is none other than Hazar Al Mansuri, a functional Czech flight pilot who will be going on an eight day mission to the ISS. Sultan Al Nayadi, a network security engineer, will be at Al Mansuri's backup. During his stay in ISS, Al Mansuri will undertake a scientific mission to study the impact of microgravity in comparison with the gravity on Earth. The mission includes 15 experiments that will be selected based on Mohammed Rashid Science Center Science and Space Competition. Guess who are the participants of the competition? School students as young as 5th grade students from all over the UAE can propose this experiment that will be studied by the astronaut in the ISS. I am so excited because my team from Jamsaron Indian School, Dubai, has also submitted a proposal to test the possible impacts of microgravity on touch nut plants, scientifically known as Mimosa pudicas. Well, good luck to all participants. Teams of 20 schools took part in the UAE's first Timatulon at E-Ice Club to showcase their very own artificial intelligence, pair one, golf boot and compete against one group from around the country. Each AI project included in the competitions are assayed based on the innovation, creativity, sustainability and positivity. Watch this mini video to see how a robot trained using AI hit the golf ball. Have you heard of stem cells and its benefits? If not, you will be amazed to know the benefits of stem cell therapy. Dr. Mehra Lufi, the first Emirati stem cell doctor, said that stem cell therapy can treat everything from diabetes to arthritis to infertility and cosmetics. Let us watch this video from Mayo Clinic to learn more about the stem cell therapy. Lou Gehrig's disease strikes in middle to later life and involves damage and premature death of nerve cells in the spinal cord and brain. These nerve cells are the ones that are responsible for controlling our movement. So loss of the nerve cells leads to progressive loss of muscle function and disability. In this trial, we are isolating stem cells from adipose tissue. A small incision in the abdomen is made and cells are removed. These cells are then placed in a special vial and from there taken to the laboratory. In the laboratory, the fat cells will be separated from the stem cells. 
We're lucky that the fat cells will float and the stem cells preferentially go to the bottom and actually stick to the plastic of the tissue culture dish. We can then separate the stem cells and by feeding them appropriate media expand them into millions of cells. In the next step of the process we then select cells and promote the growth of cells that are producing growth factors that we know will protect nerve cells from death and damage. These selected cells can then be expanded into billions of cells. This process takes several weeks in the laboratory and at the end of it we have a population of cells from the patient that are making those growth factors that we know have the potential to protect nerve cells. The patient is taken to the clinical research unit and through a spinal tap these cells will be placed into the spinal fluid. As they go into the spinal fluid they will then spread out and line the membranes that protect the spinal cord and the nerve roots. When they line the membrane they will then be in a position to secrete those growth factors that they're producing that we hope will protect the nerve cells from death. By preserving the nerve cells we will preserve function and hopefully arrest or slow down the progress of this devastating disease. Very interesting, isn't it? Dr. Mehra Lofi also identified the potential of using robots and artificial intelligence to harvest, separate and process cells before re-implanting them. I'll be back with more interesting news soon. Goodbye.